Hi, and welcome to our video on best practices for collecting and handling universal waste and used oil. I'm Jim, and this is Beth. And we're going to show you around our site and share some practices we've used to manage the waste that people in our community bring to us. Some of the things we do are required by law, but some are just methods we've developed over the years that make managing universal waste and used oil a lot simpler. We hope you'll learn something from us, or at least breathe a little easier knowing that you are doing things right. So, let's start with a definition so we're all on the same page. Universal waste are a special class of hazardous waste that are very commonly generated by both households and businesses. Collection sites like ours can handle these wastes if and only if they will be recycled or receive proper treatment and disposal. And most of them have to leave our site within a year of us collecting them. Here at our collection site, we take the following universal wastes. Mercury-containing light bulbs, also called lamps, mercury-containing devices, many types of batteries, and used antifreeze. Let me jump in here just for a sec. I just want to mention that non-rechargeable alkaline batteries, probably the most common kind found in households, are not a universal waste. In other words, they're not considered hazardous. If you or someone nearby doesn't take them, they can go in the trash. Used oil is also not a universal waste, but you do have to follow a few special guidelines if you choose to take it. We'll show you what we do with ours a little later on. Now pesticides are a universal waste, and we don't take them here, but we keep a cheat sheet with the contact info of a place nearby that does, so we can direct our customers if they have pesticides to dispose of. If your site does take pesticides, call your local DNR waste management specialist if you have any questions on how to handle it. So, Beth, let's take a look around. This is where we store the fluorescent bulbs we get. Fluorescent bulbs, either the long tubes or the smaller CFLs, have to be handled carefully because they contain mercury. We store the long tubes in boxes provided by our recycler. If your recycler doesn't have bulb boxes, you can check with bulb retailers in your area to see if they can get you one. We store our CFLs separately in a sealable plastic pail so they don't get broken by the bigger bulbs. We keep both the bulb box and the pail closed and clearly label them used fluorescent bulbs. We always write the date we put the first bulb in the box on the outside of it, so we can make sure to send the bulbs to our recycler within a year from the date we started the container. I once made the mistake of taping a few of the long bulbs together, which I now know is a surefire way to break them. As a result, I learned how to clean up a mercury spill. The Department of Health Services has a great web page for spill procedures and other health advice for people who work with mercury. So, if you ever have to clean up a spill, I suggest you start there. It's a great idea to check out that web page right away. I made up a rhyme to help remind me of a few of the rules when cleaning up a mercury spill. No vacuum, no broom, no shoes leave the room. I'm still working on how to remind myself that we can't use metal containers to store anything with mercury in it. For now, we just have a sign to remind each other. Old thermometers and older thermostats also have mercury in them and can't go in metal containers because some types of metal can actually absorb the mercury and become hazardous materials themselves. The recycler that takes these materials from us has provided us with a proper container for storing mercury devices. We label this container used mercury containing equipment and put the date we first used it on the label so we can send it away within a year's time. Also, like the lamps, if any devices break, we have to take special care in cleaning them up. If something small, like a household thermometer breaks, we can do the cleanup ourselves. But if more than two tablespoons spill, we have to call the DNR spill response hotline and hire a contractor to do the cleanup. Luckily, we've never had that happen, but it's good to know what to do in case it does. Batteries are a little less complicated. Our recycler allows us to store all different kinds of batteries we get in one five-gallon bucket. I know that some recyclers recommend other containers. Just don't store batteries in a metal container. That could lead to a fire. And like the others, we label the battery bucket as used batteries and put the date of the first time we used it so we can make sure to get it to our recycler in less than a year. The only special precaution we take is to cover the terminals of the batteries with tape before putting them in the container. I know some people like to put them in separate plastic bags too. The whole idea is just to make sure they won't short circuit. If we do get a visibly leaking battery, we put it in its own sealed container and label and date it separately. 
We store antifreeze in this heavy-duty bucket and keep it tightly closed except when we are adding antifreeze to it. You'll notice it's labeled used antifreeze and has the date we first poured antifreeze into it to make sure we send it off within a year. Right next to our used antifreeze is our used oil area. Here it is in a leak-proof, closable container labeled used oil. The only thing special about this area is that only trained personnel like us are allowed to add oil to the container. We want to make sure that no other fluids get into the container since some fluids can make the oil unrecyclable. We know of at least one site that had an expensive cleanup when PCBs got into the oil, so be careful. Oh, and there are a few rules about how oil can be moved and used. Like, be sure to use a hauler that has an EPA identification number when you send your used oil to a reclamation or energy recovery facility. You can only haul 55 gallons of oil at a time if you're not licensed. And if you want to burn the oil in an oiled fired space heater, call the DNR first to make sure you are following all the rules on this. There are also rules about what to do if oil spills on your property. In general, you just need to use absorbent materials to clean it up immediately. These oil-soaked materials need to be stored in a separate container and can usually be sent with your oil to the company doing your collection. Check with them to make sure you follow the recommended cleaning and storing procedures. And that's it! We hope you enjoyed taking a look around our site and I hope this video has inspired some ideas of your own of what you could be doing differently at your site. If you have any questions about what is required, the DNR website has lots of information. Just go to dnr.wi.gov and use search words like used oil or mercury devices. And lastly, we've also found that the companies that collect our universal waste are great sources of accurate information. And the recycling specialists at the DNR are always happy to help too. So, we leave it to you. Take care and happy recycling.